this chapter is on <laughs> circuits. That means we're going to talk about combination of resistances, basically. And also, DC instruments. So two parts. Circuits and DC instruments. And a little bit of bioelectricity. That is the goal in this chapter. Now, this is uh, pretty basic. We've talked about this yesterday. These resistors, how are they combined? And these are in, and you know the formulas. Of course, if it is in series, you just add them up, right? If it is in parallel, then you, yeah, 1 over Rp is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus all of that thing. Yeah. For some reason, Take a look at this circuit. It's a simple circuit with three resistors connected in. Everybody has a chance. Connected in. Yes. And you know that the current flows from positive to negative. See, outside the battery, it flows from positive to negative. What do you know about the currents flowing through these three resistors? They are the same. So that's a very important thing. Whenever resistors are connected in series, no matter what their values are, the currents will be the same. So that you have to remember. That's very important. And it doesn't matter. R1 could be 10 ohms. R2 could be a million ohms. Doesn't matter. If resistors are connected in series, then the currents remain the same. <laughs> now, what you see on the right-hand side is the equivalent circuit, where these three resistors have been replaced by a single, <laughs> single resistor, <coughs> whose value is determined by simply adding up these three. And you know that, right? So that is called an equivalent circuit, where you replace the resistors with a single resistor. Any questions on that? No. So that's simple that we've done that before. Which brings us to a parallel circuit that you see on top. What's given below is not so clear, but that's the household wiring, as you can see. Electrical power set up in a house. You can see how complicated that is. And this is just a small part of that. So here you see one, two, three resistances connected in parallel. And again, the currents will flow. Will the currents be the same through these three resistors? No. What will be the same? The voltages or the potential difference will be the same. So that's the second important thing. When resistors are connected in parallel, the voltage drop or the voltages across them are equal. I'll say that again. When resistors are connected in parallel, the voltages across all those resistors will be the same. And in this case, assuming that it's an ideal battery, what's an ideal battery? It's a battery that has no internal resistance. So if this has no internal resistance, whatever is its voltage, that will be the same across all three. So if it's a 10 volt battery, what will be the potential drop here? 10, 10, 10. There you go. And once again, that is the equivalent circuit that you see on the right side. Any questions on that? Now, I want you all to look at the circuit first and then calculate the quantity that's given on the right side. First, let's analyze the circuit. Of course, these two resistances, R2 and R3, are connected in, but that combination is connected in. Series. All right, so you have a battery there, ideal battery, because no internal resistance is shown, and the current is not given. You give on resistances here, all three of them. Can you please calculate the current first, and then can you calculate the potential drop across the parallel resistors? All right, so first let's calculate the current in the circuit. And I'll give you three minutes to do that, or maybe more, five. Okay. So did you understand that? Okay.
So go ahead and find I2 and I3. I know some of you have already done, but let's wait for those who are finding it a little difficult. Well, I forget to hit record, so <coughs> half of it is gone somewhere, but what can I do? So the current through I2 or through R2 is 1.6 ampere and the current through R3 is 0.75 ampere. Is everybody clear about this problem? Can we move on? Okay, great. Look, we did talk about combination of batteries yesterday, but what you see there is, what is that? They're, the two people were always smiling. They're so happy, both of them. What happened? In anticipation of exam two, that's going to be really easy, is it? <laughs> All right, this is a hydroelectric project, and this is what? Electricity from wind, and this is from batteries. What is this? All right, solar. I mean, if there is a good place on the earth to use solar energy, that would be Texas. One advantage of being here, you know? And so I am actively thinking about it. Well, not yet there. You know, thinking about the other stuff that could happen and all that. So actively thinking about it, just so you know. Um, look at the circuit, please, and help me understand, because we've already talked about this. <laughs> what you see here is what? The internal resistance of the battery, which would be really small compared to the load. Now, what's the load? The load would be the resistance of the whatever is using the electricity. If it's a light bulb, it would be the resistance of the light bulb. If it is a, oh, I don't know, ceiling fan, it would be the resistance of the ceiling fan and so forth. So the load is what really needs to use the power. Is this formula correct? Because how are these two connected? So the total would be the sum of the two, and then the current would simply be <coughs> the voltage divided by total resistance. You know, E, you know why they use E? Because this is also called EMF. You see that? So if you see that, just remember that that's another word for voltage. EMF stands for electromotive force. It's not a force. That's why I don't like using that. Electromotive, M-O-T-I-V-E. -E. Electromotive force means the force that moves the electrons. So it's an old usage, and that's why I've not been using that but remember that what we've been calling voltage, potential difference, is essentially the EMF. But I'll give you a better definition about EMF now that I started talking about it. If you take a battery and do not use it, <coughs> then it's said to be an open circuit. If you connect it with something, it's a closed circuit. You got the difference? So you have that battery, you're not using it, but you measure the voltage across its terminals. Whatever voltage you get would be the maximum. That's called the EMF. Make sense? Because when you're going to use it, because of its internal resistance, what it's going to give is always going to be... Come on. I've lost half of you. It's going to be less than what's written on it. So, for example, if you have a 1.2-volt battery, its EMF is 1.2 when you're not using it. But as soon as you start using it, it's going to be less than 1.2. It's not going to be able to give out 1.2 so much because of the EMF. I don't know why they have to add that. Anyway, now how do you recharge the battery? How do you recharge your cell phone? Yeah, yeah, you plug it in. I know. I've heard that answer many times. When you recharge a battery, like this one here, you send a current through the battery in the opposite direction to how it would normally send a current. Like when you're using a battery, how does the current flow? Don't look at the diagram yet. Tell me. When you're, uh, yeah, let's just use the circuit. How does the current flow? Positive to negative outside the circuit and negative to positive inside the circuit. Be with me. Now, when you recharge it, you send a current exactly in the opposite direction. 
Now look at the diagram and try to see what the direction of current is, if you may. Look at this, follow this. Positive. Now, that's positive of the battery. You see that? So through the inside, it's going to go from positive to negative, negative and then I hope you understood. So normally, in a battery, the current flows from negative to positive inside. See, I'm very careful because I know it can be confusing because if people are sleeping here, they only heard negative to positive. But they missed out, I said, through the inside. See, that's why I want you to be awake. That's where confusion comes in here. And it's like, he doesn't know anything. Well, did you get it? And obviously, Common sense, when you try to recharge a 12-volt battery, this source should have more voltage than 12. That's common sense, isn't it? Otherwise, it can't drive through the opposite. It's like two people fighting each other. If somebody's got to fight me, which is easy, physically, you got to have more strength than me, is what I'm trying to say, because you're trying to push me in the opposite direction. You see that? So they're kind of fighting. So when you send a car in the opposite direction, what actually happens is the chemical reaction gets reversed. Oh, first of all, the battery has chemical processes going on inside where free electrons are being released, right? So when you send a car in the opposite direction, whatever happened goes back. That's why you say recharge. And then again, it goes back to the same situation. OK, what you have here is a combination of cells. Actually, a single one is called a cell, electric cell, and it's when you combine them that you're supposed to call it a battery. We've been using the wrong usage always. So it's a single one, it's an electric cell. And if you have two of them, that's when it's called a battery. So you have a battery there, and what are these? What is R1 and R2? Internal, Internal resistances of both. And does this make sense? The formula makes sense? What is, how do you get that? Current is? EMF divided by the total resistance. Is that the total resistance? Yes, because R1, R2, and the load are in series, isn't it? But please pay attention to how these two cells are connected. See that the positive of one is hooked to the negative of the other? That's the proper way to line them up. If you reverse one of these, like the second one, that's when you will get this formula. Is anybody with me? I don't know why somebody would do that. That is crazy. You have E1 and reverse this. You know what I mean by reverse? Turn this like negative here <laughs> and positive down. Then wouldn't they be working against each other? Why would you do that? No reason. That is being stupid. Because then they fight, and the total EMF is going to be one minus the other. So never, ever do that. When cells are connected, they have to be connected like this. In which case, their EMFs add up. Is that clear enough? So if their EMFs add up, then you get a bigger current compared to what you would get when you use a single one. What about this now? How are these two connected? And we talked about this already. How are these two cells connected? Why should you connect them like that? I, we talked about it yesterday. Remember that the internal resistances are also connected in parallel. And therefore, that reduces. You see what's written here? The total internal resistance is less than either of them. Ready? All right, let's say that this is one ohm and this is one ohm. What's the total internal resistance? Ah, oh, you're taking too much time. All right, I'll try one more time. Each one is one ohm internal resistance. What's the total internal resistance? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 ohms, correct. 0. 0.5 ohms. So if you had three of them, what would be the total internal resistance? Each one ohm. One over three. One over three. So you see that the... Total internal resistance is less than either one of them any time you do that. So the more, the more. <coughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay. That's what 
You do. So you get a bigger current through the Lord. Now we come to a very important part of this chapter when I want you to pay close attention. Now, sometimes Ohm's law will not work. Ohm's law will only work in simple circuits. Now, as you can see, this is a complicated circuit, isn't it? You cannot find the currents or do anything with Ohm's law. That's where you have to know what is known as Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff is a German scientist. So I'm going to give you two of Kirchhoff's laws. I'm going to show you how to apply it in a circuit. It's right there. Laws or rules. Well, before we do that, before we attempt to do that, this is called an electrical junction. And you know why, right? Is this an electrical junction? Yes. Normally, when you look at an electrical circuit, and if you see a small dark dot there, as you see here, that means it so shows that it's a junction. Is this an electrical junction? Because there's nothing else connected there except this cable, you see that? But here, it is an electrical junction because you have two. You have resistance two, and you have resistance one. You see that? That's why it's called an electrical junction. All right, the second thing. This is called an electrical network. See, this is a closed electrical network. You see that? So how many closed networks can you see in this diagram? Two. No. Three. Thank you. Because the third one is the outer one. So the first two that you said, you know, you, you thought of when you said two are this and this. I know that, right? But there's also a third one, the outer one, which does not include R1. I mean, I'm seeing if you're paying attention. If you're able to answer what, when I pause, then you're paying attention. Otherwise, you are going to be in trouble soon. So there are three electrical networks. Is that clear enough? Now I can take you to the laws. The first law applies to a junction, and the second one applies to a closed network. So the first one is easy. I mean, both are easy, but this is the first one. The total currents meeting at an electrical junction should be zero. So the total sum of the current should be zero. All right. Here it says it a little bit more easy. Look, the sum of the currents into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents out of a junction. I want, is that into or out <laughs> of the junction? In two. What about I2 and I3? Oh. All right. So according to this law, the total current coming into the junction should be equal to the total current going out of the junction. So I1 should be equal to I2 plus I3. Simple, isn't it? Yeah. Look at the example. 11 is equal to 7 plus 4. What's the significance of the first law? This is a direct application of conservation of charge. That's important, conservation of charge. Does anybody remember? Charges can neither be created nor destroyed. So whatever charge comes in, flows out. There is no accumulation of electrical charge. You can't collect charges like you collect money in a bank. Wow, I wish that had been true in all of society. But anyway, you know what I'm trying to say? Whatever you get, you spend. See, this is, this is what I have to I'm trying to explain Kirchhoff's second law. And when I usually finish teaching this, there are some students who say, I did not understand anything. So that's because you didn't pay attention. All right, watch carefully. You see the two zeros written here? Are these two points electrically the same? 
Yes, they are. This point is electrically connected to this point, isn't it? So their potentials are zero. And you know why? Remember that the negative is always assumed to be at ground. And ground is assumed to be zero. Is that clear first? So the negative of that battery is assumed to be zero volt. OK. So when you go across here, this has 18 volt. You see that? 18 volt. So in your mind, you could have that number 18. Don't write anything. Just keep listening. 18. And then, you see that? What's the current of the circuit? 2, Two ampere. And it's flowing through 0.5 ohm, isn't it? So what's the voltage drop? One. 2 times 0.5 is 1. That's why you see, here you see 18, but here you see 17. Did anybody understand? Because one volt is gone. Got it? One volt has been dropped. So let's continue. All right, you get here, you still have 17 because this point is electrically the same as that point, right? Okay, and then 2 ampere multiplied by 6. 2 times 6 is 12. So 12 volt is lost here again. So that you end up with 17 minus 12, <coughs> which is 5. And this point is at 5, so this point should also be at Therefore, what's the voltage drop here? Five. All right, will that work out? Yes, it will, because 2.5 times 2 is 5. So let me ask you this. What's the total voltage across this closed network? And the total, when you went down through it, if you add them all up, zero. Add them in the sense, you have to understand that the battery is the only one that's supplying, and the other three are consumers. So you, you start with 18 here, but by the time you've run through 1, 2, 3, you've lost 18. So 18 minus 18 is what? Zero. There you go. So that's Kirchhoff's second rule. What is that? The sum of the voltages across the components should be zero. <laughs> Let's see how they have stated it. The sum of the changes in potential, which is the same as voltages, sum of the, so I would say the sum of the voltages around a closed loop must be zero. Okay? That's Kirchhoff's second rule. I'll let that sink in. You s look at that. When you go through the battery from zero, you're going up 18 volt. See, through the inside. See that? You're going up, and then you drop down a little bit to 17, and then it's 17 all the way, see, 17, until you get to the 6 ohm, where you drop again by 12, so you end up with 5, and then it's 5 all the way, and then you drop to 0. Make sense? So you start with 18, and you lose 18, so you end up with 0, when you take the total. Well, it's amazing to know that the, your, your fuel gauge, your fuel gauge, and this, uh, you call it the speedometer. Is that how you say it? The British call it the speedometer. You know, the first time I said it, I said, what did he say? Yeah, okay. Anyway, both of those measure voltages. But there are other mechanisms that convert the level of the fluid into a voltage. And then what you're seeing actually is a voltage. I mean, at least you understand that it's an electrical meter, like you are going to use in the lab. It's an electrical <laughs> meter. So you, did you know that before? No? And I'll talk a little bit more about the speedometer when we go into electromagnetic induction. It's amazing. It's, it's amazing because the speed with which this rotates, the tires rotate from there, you're able to calculate the speed of the car on the road. It's proportional. <laughs> And you know there cannot be anything touching those because it'll all get tangled up, you know. So it has to be a, a connection which has no physical contact, if you know what I'm trying to say, because something's rotating so fast. That's electromagnetic induction coming in. Later, it's going to get much more fascinating as we go along. All right, so take a look at the circuit. And I'll give you five minutes. And thankful they have not written the answer down. I want you to apply Kirchhoff's second law. All right, first of all, can you apply the uh, first law to this junction A? The first one, that's easy. Tell me, I1 is equal to? 
I2 plus I3. All right, let's try that E, the first rule at E, because that's not so obvious. Come on, E. Apply Kirchhoff's first rule at E. Correct. I2 is coming in. I3 is coming in. You see that? So I2 plus I3 is equal to I1. See, just because I1 is labeled here, <laughs> you have to know that I1 is the same current between A and E. See? You see that? That's where sometimes students miss out. I1, isn't the current the same across this? Okay. So I2 plus I3 is equal to I1. That's how it is. Now, I want you to write down on a piece of paper how you would apply Kirchhoff's second law in, wait, hold on, in, see how I'm going to name it, A, B, C, D, E, A. Why did I have to end that A? To show that it's closed. A, B, C, D, E, A. Go ahead. Apply Kirchhoff's second law. Let me see how many can write it correctly. Last time we were dealing with numbers, but this time I want you to write it in terms of I1, R1, like E1. See, this is E1, see that? Not numbers, just the letters. I will support you a little bit because I see the look on your faces. Hold on, one second, hold on. What is the voltage here across R2? No, don't give me numbers, now give me letters. What's the voltage across R2? I2 times R2, that should be your answer. I2 times, what's the current through R2? What's the current through R2? Isn't it I2? So you multiply I2 with R2, you would get the voltage drop here. Don't write yet, keep listening. What's the voltage drop across R1? I2 times R1. All right. What's the voltage drop across R1? I mean caps R1. So there are three voltage drops, and you name them correctly. Okay. What's the source? Isn't it E1? So isn't it easy for you to say E1 minus I2 R1 minus I1 R1 minus I2 R2 is equal to zero. I'll say it one more time. E1 minus I2 R1 minus I1 R1 minus I2 R2 is equal to zero. You think you can cram it? You can't, unless you understood. Can you do the same for the second mesh, the, the lower one? Uh, which would be A H G E A. Go ahead. A H. Take your time. The second mesh, it's E2 minus, help me out, because I can't even see. I3 times R2, is it? I3 times small R2 minus I3 times R3. You know why? Because we're going in the same direction as the current. You see? Okay. Minus I3 R3. Okay. I don't have space there, so minus I1 R1 uh, is equal to, is equal to what? Zero. Okay, I can't even write that. All right. Now, what if I had gone in the opposite direction? Like, in, instead of calling it AHG, if I had called it A, this is a point of confusion for some, and I don't know why. If I had gone A E F G H A. If I had gone in, the, in that direction, what would you do? So you start with A, A E. How are you going? A E. When you're going A E, you're going from A to E, aren't you going against the direction of current? So instead of saying negative uh, I1 R1, you would say positive I1 R1. That make any sense? Okay, let's write it for, write, write the whole thing again. I, again. At the end of it, you will understand. Write the whole thing again if you're going in the opposite direction. Let's see, let's see. Come on. Is it because the, uh, A is at zero already? And so you have to it is, it is. Okay. Because you're going towards the positive now okay. of the cell. Okay, so how would that work out? Come on. 
So that would be, if I start from A, it would be I1, R1, keep going. Are you also going against uh, the current through R3? <coughs> yes, so that would be plus, not minus, plus I3, R3. I3, R3. Plus. plus I3, R2. R2. Uh, no, let's put it as equal to zero, same way. Minus E2 is equal to zero. Now, why did I make it minus E2? Because look, you're going towards the negative instead of going towards the positive. Okay. But mathematically, these two, these two relations are the same. Does anybody agree? Yes. They are the same. Because you just changed the signs of all of them, didn't you? It's just like saying minus, oh no, let me start with the bigger number too. 6 minus, uh, 10 minus 6 minus 4 is equal to 0. If that is true, then minus 10 plus 6 plus 4 is also equal to 0. That's what I'm saying. If you change the signs of all of them, but did you get... Did you get an idea of how to apply it? Are you sure? Let me give you another chance, because this is for sure. Like, when I ask this question, I'm not trying to make you solve it. You know why we have to do this? At, in a university physics class, I would make them solve these three equations to find the values of I1, I2, I3. And that would take a lot of time, because you have a system of equations, simultaneous equations. Haven't you been taught that? With three variables, that's tough. With two, x and y, it's already tough. Now with three, I won't make you go through that, but at least you need to know how to set it up. Is that clear? All right, let's, let's uh, play around with this because it's six points on your exam. Don't you think it's worth spending like 15 minutes <laughs> for, to get that six points? What's interesting is sometimes you don't realize that you have to pay the whole attention because at the end of the day, if you stay at 89, it's going to be a B. And if you had paid a little bit more attention, that would have become an A. You, you know, that's, a, that's sad, actually. So some people are like, when they, they're doing good on the exams, they're like, let me play with the cell phone for some time. I see this all happening all the time. And towards the end, it's like exam two, they go a little down. Exam. And then at the end, they end up with 89. And when I see that 89 and look back in my memory of what that person was doing in the class, playing with the cell phone, I'd never make it 90. I promise you. Because at the end of the day, it's like, what was the person doing? Oh, was playing with the cell phone and all that, not paying attention. All right, 89, stay at 89. I did not make it an 89. Did you hear me? The person got an 89. Now, what I could have done is make it a 90 which I would do if I saw that the person had been paying attention. I'm being very honest. The person had been paying good attention, had been working hard, you know, approached me, and not to say, hey, you're so good, but with a question or two, man, now tomorrow I'm going to see 10 students outside my office. That's not what I'm saying. You know, I can see when you're trying. Even on your assignments, I'm looking at the minutes you're spending. I, I do. How much you're struggling, how much time you're spending. For some, it's like five minutes, and they get all the answers, and they get it all wrong. It tells me a lot of things. Oh, yeah, you know, you're trying. Well, on the approximate, because, you know, if you leave it open there and go away, it tracks as if you're sitting there. There's no way for it to know if you're sitting there. I'm just waiting for that software to come out, because it will track your, the mouse, motion of the mouse. Do you know that software exists like that? Yeah. As long as the mouse is not moving, it will just shut you off. It will say you're not there. Well, you, now you need to have a long stick, you know, to do whatever you're doing and shake that mouse along. <laughs> anyway, so that's good. We're always finding out. All right, so. We could have used that same circuit, but. Now we're going to talk about instruments. You know, for, first of all, you're, you're going to use all these instruments. The first instrument is called a galvanometer. Oh, I touched the wrong place. A galvanometer. What you see represented by G, well, in this diagram, okay, what are they calling it? 
Okay. So every galvanometer is used to detect a current. Have you ever heard of a detective? A detective is the most sensitive person. Am I right? Very sensitive. Galvanometer is a very sensitive instrument. It cannot be used to measure currents, point to be noted. It can only be used to detect a current. So if you want to know if there is a <coughs> current flowing in a certain part, you connect a galvanometer, and it will give you a deflection. It has a zero as the center of its scale. That means it can go either way. The pointer can go either way, which will also show you the direction of current. If it goes one way, the current is flowing in one direction. If it goes the other way, you know what I'm saying? The maximum current that a galvanometer can measure would be something like one milliampere. Well, that's just an assumed number. What's a milliampere? One by thousandth of an ampere. It's so sensitive. And if you, if you send a current of like one ampere through this, that's the end of the instrument. You'll never see it again. That's why I'm saying you cannot measure a current of one ampere using a galvanometer. You see that? But you can do something. I realized that I was on the wrong page because when I started saying this. But you can do something to the galvanometer to make it measure a large current. This is what you do. To the galvanometer, you connect a very small resistance in parallel. That's all. So, Ig is my 1 milliampere in my example. So what's Ig? G stands for galvanometer. Ig is the <laughs> maximum safe current through the galvanometer. Does that make sense? So the galvanometer can only carry how much? Ig, which is our 1 milliampere. What is shown here is the resistance of the galvanometer. Because it has a coil inside, it has a Quite a huge resistance, actually. It'll be like 25 ohms, 50 ohms. Are you listening? So the galvanometer has a huge resistance. So that is its resistance. That is the galvanometer. That's the maximum current that can flow through it. But this is the current that we want to measure up to. So in my example, that is like you need to measure up to, up to what? One ampere. While the galvanometer can only take up to one. So what do you do? You connect a low resistance in parallel. And that is called a shunt. The word shunt means a low resistance in parallel. So that's why I don't like the sentence, because it says, a small shunt resistance is placed in parallel. <coughs> so that's a repetition. A shunt itself means what? Small resistance connected in parallel. So that's like a repetition. And now I'm going to give you the formula to calculate the value of that resistance. You can't pick up anything and put it there. <laughs> and I mean, the calculation of that is really easy if you're paying attention. Here we go. Can you tell me how to calculate the voltage between these two points? The voltage between these two points. Hey, hold on. Let me also tell you one thing before I go there. You want to measure up to one ampere, but when that current gets here, it divides into two. You have picked up a value of this resistance in such a way that only the safe current goes through the galvanometer, while the remaining current goes through the low resistance. Did you hear me? All right. Now tell me. How do you calculate the voltage between these two points? There are three, two ways of calculating it. What's voltage? Isn't voltage the product of? All right. So tell me the I through this branch. One is in my example, but here it's IG, isn't it? So IG, which is flowing through. So it could either be IG times R, or it could be, come on, I times, right, aren't they going to be equal to each other? And what are we looking for? To find the value of the resistance, so it would be simply Ig by I times R. Write that formula down. That's how you work problems out. Because it's not written here, it will be 
going on, you know. So, to calculate the voltage, it could be Ig times R is equal to I times R. So, which makes it R is equal to <coughs> Ig times R divided by I. So, if I tell you that in my example, the galvanometer has a resistance of 25 ohms, go ahead and calculate. The galvanometer has a resistance of 25 ohms. So, I'm saying, come on, let's pick another call. So, I'm saying the resistance of the galvanometer is 25 ohms. The maximum it can measure is, is what? Remember that's in milliampers, yeah, and so you've got to change it into amperes, so which will be 10 raised to minus 3. And then I said I want to measure up to 1 ampere, and you're asked to calculate the value of R. So simply plug it into this equation, and you should get the answer. <coughs> Ig is 10 to the negative 3 times 25 divided by right 1, which is? 0 0.025. There you go. Now you understand why I have been saying that the resistance to be connected is low. Uh, yes. <coughs> Little r is the resistance of the galvanometer. Just like the battery had an internal resistance, that's why the galvanometer has an internal resistance. So if I ask you a question on this, and there is a question on this, it may not be exactly like this. Would you be able to answer? So the question would be, how would you convert a galvanometer into an ammeter? Oh, I didn't even mention that. A current measuring instrument is called an ammeter. It comes from the word ampere meter. Correct? So this is how you convert or change. A, uh, here it is. Change a galvanometer into an ammeter. And then sometimes you see the word like FSD, full scale deflection. <laughs> what does that mean? That means the maximum current. I mean, if in this example is one milliampere. So what will happen when you send one milliampere? If you don't connect the low resistance and you just send a current of one milliampere, how much will the galvanometer show? Full scale, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what it means. So if you see the word, Full-scale deflection, then you know it's Ig. Full-scale deflection means Ig. Okay, how's it getting? Worse by the day. To convert a galvanometer into a voltmeter. Now, what is a voltmeter? Used to measure volts. All right, in my example, What's the maximum voltage that this instrument can measure <laughs> if I don't do anything to it? Okay, what are we talking about? We're talking about a galvanometer, which can carry only up to 1 milliampere, and which has a resistance of, I thought, 25. Didn't I say 25? Yes, okay, 25. so 25 ohms. So this one, if you do not do anything, what's the maximum voltage that this guy can measure? It's right there. You, ha you know the maximum current that can go through it, and you know its resistance. What do you got to do? Multiply. Multiply and that would be a small number, wouldn't it? Because it's 10 to the negative 3 times 25, which would be 0 0.025 volt. But our previous answer, this just got to be the same because of chance, okay? Don't think it's always the same. My goodness. Because of the numbers. Now, can this be a useful voltmeter? <laughs> it can only measure up to... So we want to measure up to 10 volt. What do you do? You've got to do something. I mean, if you just put it across, you know, you give the 10 volt to this guy, it's gone. That's a bigger IG. You, uh, no. <laughs> the, you cannot change the IG. IG is the maximum safe current. You can't. Now, this is actually, you had seen it here before you. You connect a high resistance. You connect a high resistance in, how is this connected? Series. That's it. Exact opposite of what you did before. So to change it into a voltmeter, connect a high resistance in series with the galvanometer. That's it. And the calculation there is much easier. Much, much easier. Go ahead, tell me. 
How do you calculate the value of the voltage? I can take your cell phone away and if it gives you a lot of... <laughs> anyway, sometimes that's what I have to do. All right, so how, how would the voltage be in this case? How do you measure? What's the formula? You got there. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me label something. You're right. So IG is the safe... Oh, that's supposed to be a G. Anyway. Okay. Tell me what you said just now. Uh, so you're using G equals I times R, but for R, it would be um, R plus like the little R. So it should be IG times R plus... That's it. You got your formula. There you go. Makes sense, doesn't it? And what are you solving for? Oh, no. The caps are. So separated. What will you get? <coughs> well, here again, students make a mistake. Did you see how I wrote it? It's the voltage divided by IG and then take away the R. <coughs> you know what students would do? I know, they would just go V minus R by G, and that will be a multiple choice answer right there. So that's how you, so let's work out that problem with the same values that I've given you, 10 volt, and come on, what's the value of the resistance that you got? I said you, you want to measure up to 10 volt, didn't I? So 10 divided by, this is 10 to the negative 3, you all remember that? Because it's 1 milliampere, which is 10 to the negative 3 ampere. Correct? Esmeralda? Did I call the right person? Okay. okay always. Oh, one has glasses. Okay. And now tomorrow you'll change that. Both of you have, right? I uh, know. See, so you're trying to play all tricks on me. Okay. <laughs> Minus 25. So how much do you get? Ah, no, 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 no. Because 10 divided by 10 minus 3 is 10 to the 4. So that'll be like 10,000 minus 25. 9,000. Correct. I just wanted you to see that it's such a big, big number. So how do you convert a galvanometer into a voltmeter? By connecting a high resistance in... See that? Okay, uh, all right, that would do it for today because I